Hey, hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Rodeo Kids Podcast. I am your host, Kia Marie Rorda, and it has been a little minute. Um, it's summertime. It's rodeo time. We have been busy. I had a baby, and the Rodeo Kids ambassadors have been out doing their own thing as well. So we've been on a little short-term hiatus, but today we are back, and we are bringing you an awesome podcast with a young lady who is making a name in the barrel racing world through TikTok. I mean, clearly she's doing it through her skills and her ability and her willing to coach, but she's using TikTok and social media as a platform to help so, so, so many others. And we are so excited to have her on the podcast today. She shares so many little tips, tricks, insights, mental game things, um, just to to help us all to the conversation just kind of opens our minds and and helps think about things that maybe we haven't thought about before. So we are super excited to welcome Brianna Brown with Barrel Racing Tips on TikTok. Give her a follow, check it out, and of course, listen to the Rodeo Kids podcast. And don't forget to hit that follow button so you can hear the podcast we have coming up. World changer, history. Welcome to the RodeoKids.com podcast, where we empower youth to be their best selves through the values and traditions of the rodeo and Western lifestyle. Welcome to the Rodeo Kids podcast. My name is Allison Julian. I'm an ambassador this year, and we are joined by the owner, Miss Camry, and another ambassador, Isaiah. So, before we get started, I'd like to say a short prayer, and then we will get into it. Dear God, I pray that you just be with us during this podcast, and that we use this to glorify you, and I pray that you be with that, with us throughout the rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. So, first off, I'd like to start off with, if you can tell us who you are, and a little bit about yourself. Yes. Also, first off, I love that we said a prayer. We're starting on that level. I love that. Okay, now I know where I can kind of be with this. Yeah, that's a huge part of my life too. But anyways, so my name is Brianna Brown. Um, I'm a barrel racing coach and I travel across the U.S. doing clinics. I teach lessons in person. And I mean, the biggest thing that people know me from is just social media. So I do a lot of social media with creating content for people that want to get into horses or they want to learn how to care for them, feed them, train them, like all levels, all stages of the horse world, like I make content on that. So um, that's like my biggest thing about me. There's a lot of different things. I'm a wife. I'm, you know, I help my husband with his business. We own two businesses together. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, live in Idaho currently, but we're moving to Utah. So yeah, there's me in a nutshell though. Yeah. I saw where y'all's house, was it for sale? Is that? It is for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. So you said y'all own two businesses. So what are those? Mm-hmm. So-, so my, yeah, my business, Barrel Racing Training Help, which is all my social media stuff and all the clinics fall under that. All my coaching falls under that. And then my husband and I breed and train jobs. So keeps us very busy, but that's, yeah, that's what we do. And it's really fun. We love it. We get to meet a lot of, a lot of awesome people and it's been like a dream come true, really. So yeah, y'all travel quite often, don't y'all? for clinics we do I so it kind of depends on the year last year I was on a plane like I swear every weekend like doing clinics so it was really busy and then this year I kind of scaled back and I'm doing more of the social media stuff and then more of my husband's stuff and all that kind of stuff so I'm doing more in-person lessons that are like at my place this year and I haven't done as many clinics well I haven't done any clinics this year um but it just it wasn't my focus this year so maybe next year I'll focus on a little bit more and go travel but it's it's a lot and I just I'm like yeah it's not my focus this year each year I kind of have a different focus and it just wasn't my focus this year as much as I love it I am like itching just do one I'm like no 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 you got to focus on other things you got to stay focused but yeah I get that staying busy is great when you're doing what you love but also yes there's a lot that goes into it past that there is yes there totally is so how when you did your clinics were you would you go to one like say you were somewhere Friday and then Saturday like you were in a different state is that how that went or how did it go 
No, I would usually run them. I mean, I was still competing and doing, you know, I still have to run both of our businesses. So I pretty much would fly out to one place and do like a Friday, Saturday clinic. And then I would fly home on Sunday. So then I had the time to come back. I had the week to, you know, get things done and then I could go somewhere else um, for the weekend. But yeah, I, I wasn't going like place to place. I could not do that. My husband would be like, get home and take care of your dang horses. But you know, it's, yeah, I had to make sure I came back and, you know, took care of everything at home, but yeah. I feel that. So how often do you rodeo as far as it, it depends. Um, I feel like, like I said, I'm always in a different stage of life. So, um, out of like, I rodeoed all through high school and I did high school rodeo stuff. I graduated high school and I rodeoed pro for like two years, I want to say, and then I finished college and we bought this property and I got a project horse. And so I don't, I don't get to rodeo as much as I wish. Um, you know, the one that I have right now is kind of like still in the making. So he's not really ready for that level yet. So I, I don't get to do it as much as I wish I could do it. But if, you know, if I had more of a team, that's the thing. When you get to be an adult, you buy property and you buy a house and you are running businesses. Like you don't get to go and rodeo every single weekend sometimes as you wish you could, but that's kind of that's where it is for our, me it just it depends but not as not as much as I wish I could we're working up to that once he's ready to go then I'll be like bye every single day but no that would be yes <laughs> I may not be the best but <laughs> yeah. you mentioned having a team too and like that's pretty important to have horses that you can you know like I I just got my card to break away this year I've barely raced in the past and for rodeo and done all the kind of the same things that you've done um but this is my first year having my card to break away and um, it doesn't really awesome. matter what you're doing, though. I think it's really important to have a couple of horses because, you know, you don't want yes. to just drill on with your running barrels. Like you don't want to do all your drills on your finished horse that's ready to go rodeo, but you still need to keep yourself tuned up. Same yeah. thing with roping. You know, you don't want to rope 100 calves on your good horse. You want to rope, you know, a handful um, a few times a week, but you still need to keep yourself tuned up. And so that's where having Definitely. one, two, three five, 10 horses. Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes. Oh, definitely. And people don't realize that. Like, why aren't you rodeoing all the time? Well, I, I, yeah, the same reason. Like, I don't want to be tearing one down where you have to have backup. Like if you're going to go rodeo that much, like one horse isn't going to do it sadly. So it, it's good to have backup. I agree. It's, it's nice to have somewhere you can kind of spread the runs across and you're not just hammering one. So yeah. I agree. Yeah. So the one yeah. you're talking about, not finished all the way is that legend your gray yes yes mm -hmm. is he young he no he's i want to say he's like eight he's eight so but young i thought he was a little older young ish but i i got him about two years ago he came from an nfr qualifier he was a rope horse and so I took him, he was pretty green broke. I, he wasn't, I like him really fancy broke. I'm so nitpicky about that. So he was not to like the level that I wanted. And so I spent so much time just like making him fancy broke and like how I really want him to ride and, you know, move. So it's, it's taken a long time and as it does for any horse in any discipline. So yeah, that's, yeah, he's the one that I do it on, but I, I haven't had him that long. So it's just, we're kind of to the end of like, okay, now you're like super nice and fancy broke. Now we can kind of hit the barrels a little bit more, but that's, you know, that's the stuff I don't put all over social media, but maybe I should. Cause everyone's like, why? But I'm like, huh? Like <laughs> it's all part of the process guys. <laughs> but I will definitely back that up to like, I got a horse, um, just by coincidence, he was eight. He was really pretty. And my aunt had him. She'd been trail riding on him and he is not a trail horse. Um, and yeah. so I had an opportunity to buy him for, um, a decent price. He's got kind of mm -hmm. some family history in our family and stuff. But when I got him, like he had the buttons, you know, he was super fancy broke and at eight years old, it was really easy for me to start running barrels and roping on him because he already had those buttons. And yeah. I think it's really, really easy, especially like when we watch on social media and like for the the younger kids, like, uh, you know, when I grew up, we didn't have social media. Um, so you yeah. couldn't necessarily compare yourself to, oh, that girl just bought this horse and she's doing this and she's doing that and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it really is a slow process. And it it's is. funny, I just saw something on social media today and it was like the training of a 1D barrel horse, like 4D, 5D, 3D, 2D hit a thousand barrels back to, Oh, got a glimpse of the one D back down to crashing barrels back up. And like, 
And that's yeah. just the process of entering, let alone the process of um, just getting that foundation. Yes. And I just, I feel like so many people, it doesn't matter if you're roping or running barrels or what it is, they miss the foundation part because they want to look the part. Um, yes. And so they want to look like they can go around barrels. They want to look like they can chase a calf. But if you could, if they would spend another six months, another eight months, just really building that foundation and incorporating elements of the events that they're wanting to work on into it. Like, sure, use a barrel and a drill, but don't drill the pattern. Yes. I think that yes. makes a huge difference. It does. And I mean, I, I try and tell people that tone blue in the face on social media. Probably people are like, shut up, Brianna. Like, we don't care. But it's horsemanship is so important. And I mean, when I do clinics and I teach lessons, half the time, like I'm not even working the actual barrel pattern. Like I'm not even working on mm -hmm. barrels or even looking at barrels. Like if you come and ride with me, if you can't ride, you can't teach your horse to do X, Y, Z, we're not going to go on the pattern. Like that's the biggest thing that I have noticed. And I feel like what sets me apart when I go to the clinics is horsemanship is such a big focus. Like I believe if a horse is super broke, they can do whatever they want. They can go chase a calf down. They can go run barrels, run poles. They can do whatever they want. And it's not hard. Like it's not a hard thing. What makes it hard is when these horses aren't broke and they don't understand what the mm -hmm. heck is going on. Why is the rider pulling on my face? And why are they asking me to do this? Like that's when it gets hard. So it's, it's not like a hard thing, but they have to be broke. And that's, that's something I preach again until I'm like blue in the face, but it's so important. Like you said, like if they're broke, like that's, that's three fourths of the battle. Like mm -hmm. it, it's so important, but like so many things, it's really not that hard if you take the time, but time is patience yes. and patience is hard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. But I mean, and I try to tell people this too. It's like, okay, if you take the time now to make this horse broke, truly broke, like they understand everything from haltering to bridling to riding to everything. If they understand that now, you're going to go so much further. Eventually, if you take a horse that's not as broke and you put them on the pattern, you're going to hit a wall eventually and you're not going to mm. know how to deal with it and you're going to have to come back to the basics. So you may as well just deal with them in the beginning. Same with starting a cult. Deal with the basics in the beginning so you don't have to come back and keep messing with it. But I guess it's it's interesting. The rodeo world just struggles hard to figure that out. And I'm like, I'm on a mission. I'm like, guys, just get your horse broke. Get them fancy broke. Like, you'll be good. It's It's not hard. You're not going to miss out. But it's it does yeah. wonders when they're actually broke but well I think they're one of the biggest reasons that the the rodeo industry does is like 90 percent of people are self-taught or taught by their parents you know whereas if yes. you compare it to western pleasure even or um dressage or any other discipline pretty much with the exception of trail riding um yeah has a coach and you go into it your parents go into it you enter that industry knowing that if you are going to excel, you are going to need to ride under somebody. Somebody's yeah. going to help you train your horse. Somebody's going to help, you know, you're going to lessons consistently. You might even have your horse at another barn all the time. Rodeo is like a free for all. Like, hey, enter it up, cowboy. Like, if you want to yes. sign the check, you're entered. Yes. Oh, I agree. It's such a weird world. And it, I don't know. I hope I'm doing a decent job on social media with that. But it's like, and that's where I was great. at. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's where I was at. Like when I started, like it was self-taught. Like I get that. Like I didn't feel like I had the money to go put it into lessons and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I wish I would have. But, you know, money mindset's a whole nother thing in the road. In the road, you know, <laughs> we won't get into that. But yeah, like I started the social media stuff just because I was like, man, like when I was first starting, I didn't really have anyone to learn from. Like I was Googling things and YouTubing things and there wasn't that much out there. Now I feel like there's quite a bit out there, but there wasn't that much. And I'm like, well, I may as well just be that person that actually shows people how to do it. Right. Cause there's mm -hmm. so much out there that I'm like, Oh, that's not good. Don't do that. <laughs> it's going to yeah. end up bad. But yeah. yeah so it's, it's interesting. It's a fun little trail that I came down, I guess, but yeah. That's, that's what I always say. No matter how long you do it, you're never going to know everything. You're always learning, no matter yes. who it's from. Yes. And I started consistently riding in 2019, and I took mm -hmm. lessons up until, well, I, I still take lessons. Like, I've got a coach, but I didn't buy my first horse till December of 23, but I had him for, like, a month 
before like a trial and kept him. But I was like, it it's when they're not broke, it's hard to just go and start one on the pattern because they, they don't know anything. If you yes. can get their nose and they're like, what, what are you doing? Why are you touching my face? Why am I supposed to be in my body like this? It's just so difficult and people don't understand like, well, I started my horse and he's running barrels and running in the one day after three or four months. And it's just so different because every horse is different. They're not all yeah. the same. If they're not fancy broke or they're not broke broke, it's just so hard to put them yes. on the pattern. And yes, they're going to know it and they're going to stick with it, but it's just going to take longer for them to click with it when they don't know as much as all these other horses do. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. And and that mindset of like, you're never going to know everything, I feel like takes you really far. Like, I I got to the point where if people come to me, they want help, but they're not open minded enough, then I almost just turn them away. Because like, if I'm going to help you, I'm going to spend time teaching you like you got to be open minded, like you're never going to know everything. But you've got to be so open minded. And if you can do that and come in with the mindset to a trainer, or a coach and come in just like, I, I don't know. Like I've had a lot of experiences where I just come in, like every time I go to my trainer, I come in with humble. I know nothing. I need help with this. And like, that's how you have to go. And that's how you learn the most. But so many people just don't want to put the pride aside and just be gone with it. But yeah, that mindset will take you really far. If you can just understand that you're never going to know everything, but be open-minded and still, still try and learn all you can. Yes, because it's I've started. Still, go ahead. I've started having a questionnaire before kids come for lessons and stuff, and just for the parents and the kids to sit down and be like, "How much time do you have to get to dedicate to this? How much time are you willing to? Like, what's your timeline for buying a horse if they're using one of mine? Like, I'm more than happy to provide lessons and to educate people. Um, yeah, but at the same time, I don't want to be taken advantage of, and I don't want to waste your time or my time. So, um, I think people being really honest with themselves, you know, and, and if you're going to, if for those who are listening are beginner beginners, you know, go to a place that just teaches the foundation, you know, and some people enjoy yeah. doing that. And you know, we've got a girl that lives close to us and, and she has like the ponies that go on the little merry-go-round for the five dollar rides and so she's got really good ponies for them to just learn the very basics I don't want to do that anymore yeah, you know and definitely. and knowing that when you sign up for lessons like the caliber of coach you are you have you know like letting that be a stepping stone too um and and not that I haven't done but like it just got to where sometimes you know you, you end up doing pony rides and you're giving pony rides to people who never plan on having a horse um yeah so having those a uh, questionnaire and those questions before so people know and to also kind of prime them um yeah. for what we expect we also have a list of rules and we have a um we actually have them on the rodeo kids website they're arena signs and it's like if you say can't you have to run a down and back if you think oh. this you have to do push-ups um if you whine or complain you have to do sit-ups if you are overly aggressive to your horse you have to do all three of them three times um, and that's on my or whoever catches you like that's on your can like you call them out um, and they can't complain about it. And it goes for not just the kids who are riding, but parents, spectators and everybody else in between. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that. I'm going to have to go look at that. That is perfect. I love yeah, that. But it does just set the stage to be like, OK, like this is what we expect here. Like we it, like at the bottom, it says sincerely people who want to see you succeed beyond today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how it is in real life, like business and et cetera. Like that's really how it is. Like it needs mm -hmm. to be carried over just to every other sport too. Like, I don't know. It, it's interesting. Like I played softball for over 12 years. I played through high school and everything. And the standard of like playing softball is so different than like the rodeo world. Like, I don't, I'm not sure what it is, but like softball is a high standard. Like same with like what you're saying. Like if you say can't, or you say this, blah, 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 there's consequences. But like, for some mm -hmm. reason, like some of us have not added that, I guess, into the rodeo world. And it's like, man, we're lucky to like have these amazing animals that we get to ride and train and be around. Like, it's such a privilege. Like no, not very many people get to do it. There's like a small percentage of people that get to do it. So yeah. sometimes it's like, okay, you got to like realize like, this is cool. Like you don't have to have a negative attitude about it, but yeah. Interesting. You know, a little tangent, but that's cool. I'm not going to yeah. look that up on your website. 
That's yeah. really cool. I like that. Yeah. If you always have that mindset, like you don't need help. Like I know what I need to do. This is my horse. I ride him. Y'all don't. And it's, it's just so hard to take advice from somebody when you already have the opinion that you know what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And I feel like, I mean, along the lines of that is like, you do have to be careful who you take advice from, especially for like all the beginners out there. Like I talk to a lot of people and you know, they're just starting out. They're trying to figure out what they're doing. And it seems like there's so many outside opinions when you start getting going, like you start asking people like, Hey, how do I feed? How do I care? How do I ride? Blah, blah, blah. And like, it gets daunting. It's like, Hey, like who the heck do I even listen to? And I mean, I always tell people like pick a couple people that you've watched them ride. You know how they take care of their horses, watch how their horses actually act as they ride and see like, are those horses legitimately happy? Do they look good? Do they feel good? Those are the people you want to watch and take advice from. Like don't take advice from everybody. You almost have to like kind of keep your blinders on and like, these are the people I want to take advice from and those outside ones I'm not going to. But then exactly what you said, like when you have those people in your corner, like, yeah, open your eyes and listen, try and, you know, really just take in everything that you can from those people that understand it. Like so important. That's a really good mindset for sure. Yeah. And that, like I was saying, I bought my first horse in 23. Well, I started him on barrels and he started doing really really good and he'll have good runs but every now and then like he'll blow off a barrel blow off an impulse. and I remember last year I was struggling so much because I had everybody telling me to sell him and get rid of him and move on and I was just like I can't do it I can't give up on him I know he can have a really smoking run and then he has a really bad run there's something going on so yeah went to the vet because he started refusing the gate and I was like that that's it. That that trip. We went and he had to get injected in his hawks. And he had to be mm-hmm. off. He had before he got injected, he'd be off for four months, the whole winter off. And he came back and started having really good runs. And he don't do it as often now because he's feeling better. But it's just the idea of getting pain out of his mind is what we're struggling with right now because he ran on it for so much. But you wouldn't know that he was hurting because he never acted like it unless it was just yeah. like and I didn't have a, like a bunch of background information on him when I bought him. I just knew they rode him every now and then, checked cows on him, did this and that. But he sat in the pasture most of the time. So it, it could have just been like something, oh, he probably has acted like this before because he can be barn sour. He can be buddy sour, but he's not bad. It's just every horse sometimes has those. Let me turn to my buddy and go over here. But it, I just remember I was struggling so much because everybody was telling me to sell him. And I had like a handful of people that were telling me not to sell him. And I was like, who, who do I pick? The people yeah. that sell him, the people that say not to sell him. But if I sold him, he'd still be hurting. So there's yeah. so many different opinions that I had that I didn't know what to pick from. So yeah. it's just really hard. And I remember constantly praying about it. Like, what do I do? Do I go take, do I keep him? Do I sell him? Do I keep him? Do I sell him? And I just went back and forth, back and forth. And I finally just got to the decision where I was like, I can't give up on him because I know mm-hmm. he has a really good run and he really loves it when he wants to, but it's just the idea of getting his mindset right. If that yeah. makes sense. Oh yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like As he's say- good back and going though. So that's, that's good. I'm glad. Yeah. As you say that too, like, who do I pick to listen to? And, you know, just like what you ended up doing, like at the end of the day, pick yourself, like trust your gut and know what you, whatever, you know, you're praying about it. God's going to give you the answer that is right for you and for your horse. And, you know, yes, like uh, Brianna said, and like Allison, you talked about too, picking those two or three people that are at the level that you want to, who have the horsemanship, who have all of that. And you can still be kind to your friends. I mean, cause your friends oh, yeah. and a lot of the people, I would say 95% of people have good intentions. I mean, there are the Definitely. 5% who are going through something in their life or who were raised in a way that the good Lord just needs to find yeah. his way into their, uh, into their prayers and into their sleep at night sometimes. Um, yes. <laughs> But otherwise, people, you know, they have good intentions when they're helping you. And just remembering that, too, and having grace, like, hey, like, I know that you're trying to help me right now, but this just isn't for me. And and even if you don't tell them that, but, like, pretending like you're telling them that, so that you're telling yourself that, I think, really helps. It's something that I've had to do in the past. Like, you know, like, I appreciate that person. 
I appreciate that they are trying to help me, but I am going to not listen to this. I'm going to choose to separate myself from that information. Um, and yeah, Definitely. at the end of the day, just making sure that you choose yourself and trust your gut. Yeah, I agree. Even trust, I like, Heavenly Father just has, man, been so, like, if that's something people believe in, I say lean on that so much in horses. Like, for me, for so long, like, fast story, um, like, with my big gray, I had a long time where I had no idea how the heck to go about like collection on him. Right. Like I knew how to collect horses up and I had like done it in the way that I knew how to do it. Right. Like it worked on every other horse, but I got my big gray and he is a totally different caliber of horse than anything I had ever had. Right. And so for the longest time I had struggled and struggled and struggled and I couldn't get him to collect. And there were so much holes in his training that I just didn't have the knowledge and I couldn't even find the people to help me. Mm-hmm. And like, it was such a topic of like prayer all the time. I just was like, I don't know what to do with this horse. I'm like having this problem and this problem. And I, I can't find people to help me. And um, like, I would even go to like, I lived in Utah at the time, but I would go to trainers that were like top, top, top trainers in Utah and they would try and help me. And I would go home all excited, like, hey, I'm going to get this and it's going to be great. And I would start doing it and I'm doing it exactly how they said to do it. And it just, it never worked. So finally, you know, we get down the road a little ways and actually with this property that we live at right now, we like, we're so supposed to be here. Like it was such an answer to prayers when I, when we moved here, actually my next door neighbor is my trainer. It was like funny enough. I like started talking to him and I was like, Hey, I have this horse that I, I literally, I'm at my wits end. Like I'm going to s- probably sell him. Like I'm frustrated with him. I've tried for years and years and years. And like-, like I was constantly praying about it. Like, man, I don't know what to do and I can't figure this out. And so a big answer to our prayers was like moving to this property so I could meet him and like change my absolute way of writing training, like so many different things like now I feel confident enough to like you bring me any kind of problem I'm gonna know how to fix it like I've already been through all this I'm gonna know how to fix it mine is cold training or cold starting I'm not a cold starter nope not my thing but like it's it was such like a cool thing to like see that happen like this house actually sold and it came back up and then we got it and it was like we were supposed to be here like that was like one of the many ways like Heavenly Father had just answered my prayers like yep here you go. You worked hard enough. <laughs> Here you go. It, it was so cool to watch that like play out. And now you look at legend and he's like, I, you know, he's not the most fancy broke horse. Yeah. He's not to my standard, but like, you know, he's collected and he's nice and he can, you know, run around how he should be. So yeah, that's a big thing. Like, even if you feel like you don't have people in your corner, like rely heavily on heavily father, he's going to make it work out for you. Like just yeah. keep after it. He'll make it work out for you. He wants to see you succeed. So yeah, and it's just those horses that you've got blood, sweat, and tears put into that just make it, you have so much of a deeper connection than you would with other horses. And every horse is different. Yeah. They're not all going to ride around the same. They're not all going to trot around the same circle or the same barrel and make it perfect like the one did before that. And I think that was my thing. I had put so much work into him, and he had already come so far that I was like, I can't sell him, but at the same time, I knew if I did sell him, I could buy something that was already running. So it was so difficult to pick, but keeping him, I think that was the right decision. And he's doing really good. Like he'll still have a bad run, but always walk out of the arena petting him, no matter how bad it was. Because if you don't- Just like we're human. We have human moments. They have horse moments. Definitely. (laughs) They do. Like so many different things. Like- I mean, I probably have different opinions than everybody else, but like they're sitting there pawing. Yeah, they're irritated. They don't want to stand there any longer. Like they're swishing their tail. Yeah, it's his tail. He can do whatever he wants with it. Like they're, they're horses. Like half the time we have to remember that they're still living thing. Like they're going to have their moments. So, and you know, that's not to disregard things that happen with pain, but they're still, they're still horses just like we are. They give us grace, a lot of grace, probably more than we need half the time, but Yes. They yeah. They're they're awesome though. When- Before you ask your next question, Allison, or, or talk about the next topic, I just want to backtrack just a smidge. When you were talking about 
you know, moving was an answered prayer. There was something that you said in that that really stood out to me. You said that I had worked hard enough for it and God was like, okay, now go ahead. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Like, I think so many times, whether it's horse related, life related, whatever, it's like, well, I've been praying for this and I've been praying for this. It's like, but have you been working for it? (laughs) Yeah. You know, working towards that answered prayer as well. You know, like God's not going to just give you something just because he, you know, he's not a handout kind of God. (laughs) No. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that, I mean, people forget. It's like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to say a prayer and then I'm going to get to work. And I think that's when Heavenly Father really, at least for me, and I, I think for most people, but that's when I feel like he really is like, okay, like they're serious about this. Like I'm, I'm going to help them. And he likes to be included in those little things. Like even the little things of like, I don't know, just random little tiny things. He wants to be included. And when we include him and acknowledge that, I feel like he's more apt to keep helping us because we're, you know, we're being grateful and same with like humans in relationship. Like you tell people, thank you. I appreciate your time. Like people are more apt to keep helping you. I, I have just noticed that quite a bit, at least with my relationship with him but yeah I agree like I've got this client horse in she's five and she's great fancy broke I mean broke broke but she's more of the type where she's sheltered she doesn't she's terrified like loud noises she's about jumps and tractor starts she starts shaking she's just a nervous mare and she's just got you just got to be so patient with her and that's like all these other horses I have bomb proof and then you get the ones that are like terrified if a fish jumps out of the pond she's (laughs) sitting there on the ground dying it's just one of those things you've got to be so patient with because we took her to a show Saturday and she did great in the warm-up but I had three horses I was running so I literally had to get off loosen the saddle take off the boots go get the next horse. And I did that after made three runs and then did it all over again. So I made six runs switching back and forth from, and I think she was just nervous on top of the lights in the arena, the sound, the music. And she tried, she was bucking, she was bucking around and rearing and she popped up and like launched forward. And I was like, if I get onto her now, the next time she comes in the arena and don't do it, if she messes up, she's going to think about me getting onto her and she's going to get more frustrated. She's going to get more nervous when I'm doing this. And I remember just petting her all the way, like letting her kind of just chill out and see everything. I wasn't going in there to try to win the one D I just walked and trotted her, but I was like, it's just, you've got to be so patient with it, especially when you're starting new ones on not just like the pattern, but taking them and starting to haul them when they're already so nervous. It's just one of those things. Like you got to just take in, you've got to be chill. Like, to let your horse know you're not freaking out because if you're freaking out they're going to sense that and they're going to freak out so it's just one yeah. of those things you got to just chill out about and ask for patience for definitely yeah patience takes you a long ways and those sensitive horses are my favorite to run it's like if you you know 95 percent of people are never going to get the caliber of sensitive horses that like some of us get to ride but for us if you can get your hands on one of those they teach you the most like they teach you so much like especially what you're saying with like you know being able to channel your inner just peace and calmness like that transfers onto them so much and it, it teaches us a lot too and yeah it's such a process to you know take one and haul them and get them used to things and you know we can't expect too much out of them like it's just part of the process like it it takes a hot second for them to get used to it and they'll get it but you know patience yeah and I I, I mean she did as expected it's a new environment we took her up there the night before and let her ride I mean it was just me and I had another horse with me so it was just she'd been in that arena before once but then you switch it to the night with the lights the announcer the music the kids running around the other horses the nickering at her and the sites the trailers the cars it's just totally different environment for them yeah oh definitely it is such a process but you'll get it you'll totally get it so are you a first generation cowgirl or is it been in your family no I wouldn't say so um I want to say probably third um my dad grew up on a ranch so they did cows they would ranch you know 
with horses and all that kind of stuff but um he moved to the city and raised us in the city for the most part and then you know the whole trail came down the before I ever got into it so it was in my blood but yeah definitely not a not a first generation thing he he knew quite a bit about it his parents had ranched and yeah so probably third generation maybe a little bit further maybe I don't know <laughs> probably third at least as, as far as I know third uh was horses always in your career like something you wanted to do or was that something you did later on um I would say it was always something that I knew I wanted to kind of do in the back of my mind uh probably like my one of my earliest memories I don't know how old I was I was maybe five I remember being at a rodeo and like watching barrel racers and just like getting chills like wow that's super freaking cool and I wanted to like ride horses for a long long time but we were in the city like I had to go take lessons so I took like my first lesson at eight and then my parents were like that's way too expensive like so I like took it like a um dang it what do you call it a therapeutic type barn so it was way more expensive because I was just taking like a normal lesson and so my parents were like that's way too expensive we're not gonna do that so then finally at 13 I started taking lessons and I got going for probably like six months or so and one of the days I finished up um riding because we had like learned how to run barrels that day and I like walked through the pattern and I was like that's what I want to do the end I'm like just from a walk how did I know that but it was super funny and I just got in that truck after uh, my dad picked me up and I was like dad I want to get a horse he's like fine okay you figure out how much it's gonna cost where to put it and you pay for everything but the horse and we'll do it and I did it so that's kind of where it all started now I'm forgetting what your original question was but that's where it all started that that's what basically what the question was. okay good I'll, I get going and you're like write it in Brianna it's not even I asked <laughs> <laughs> so uh what made you want to start doing videos and clinics and what's the experience been like overall awesome like so incredibly awesome so when I think I was in high school I started um I started kind of like getting into YouTube I had like a random idea like I should start YouTube and I started YouTube and I had a lot of fun with it. I had zero idea what I was doing. And so I started more into like Instagram and got going with that. And I got into college and I started in college um, in Utah and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And I just didn't seem like I liked anything. So I transferred to a college here in Idaho that had a social media program. And I like called my dad one night and I was like, dad, they have a social media program this is what I want to do. This is so cool. Cause like I'd already been doing YouTube. I had quite a bit of like decent success with it. And I just like fell in love for some reason with just teaching people like, Hey, this is, you know, me going to a rodeo. I had like these cringe rodeo vlogs and I'm, like, don't go back and watch those. Those are so embarrassing, <laughs> but I would like do that. And then I started kind of like just teaching people things that I was doing with my horses and I was getting a lot of traction in like a community of people like asking questions and like how do you do this and how do you do that and so it really just like evolved and so when I was in college um, I'd say that's when it like really took off I started going and like doing TikTok I got in a class and I had a guy um, was like hey like have you ever tried TikTok and I was like no because I like started and I was kind of like already an influencer at that point and so he was like, did you try TikTok? And I'm like, no. So I started into TikTok and then everything kind of blew up. Like it would just started going and going. And I started getting brands attention, partnering with them. And then I just like, just had this massive like doors opening and deciding that I wanted to do clinics and teaching in person. And it just, it was really just based on this community and really cool. Like I still have all those people that are like, I watched you like five years ago and it like mm -hmm. makes my day, but so it's it to answer your question, it's been really, really cool. Like just to have that for one as a business that I get to work whenever I want and really, you know, do whatever I want to do. Um, but for two, like the amount of people that I've met through social media is like so amazing, <clears throat> like super cool. I've met 
awesome people. I've went awesome places. I've had brands take me cool places. Like there's just been so many experiences that I've been lucky enough to have through the social media stuff. And the clinics are something like I just started consistently last year just because everyone was like, hello, like you should do this. Like, please come to where I am. And I was like, I should, I should try this out. Like I have enough reach. I should try and do it. And so it overall, yes, to answer your question, it's been a really cool experience. And I had no idea. I don't like to call myself an influencer half the time because it gives like a cringe title, but I had no idea I was going to like end up here, but I'm so glad I did. Like it's social media has been awesome and just opened so many doors. So. So you said that you've gotten brands attention. So what are some of your biggest brands that you've gotten to do deals with? Yeah. So, and keep in mind, like I do this for a living. So like, for those of you watching, like do not get harping on yourself. Like I spent day in day out like people are like oh how do you how do you do this like dude I'm working 24 7 I kid you not so um a couple of them that I worked with is like Redmond Equine Weaver Troxel um B&W Trailer Hitches Muck Boots um I'm trying to think 32 Degrees those are probably trying to think there's plenty of other ones but those are probably like the most that you would like kind of recognize I guess Mm -hmm. but where do you see yourself moving forward from this? Um, man, people have asked me that. And I'm like, a, I'm a very goal oriented person for sure. But honestly, I kind of just put my head down and like meet my goals with it. And I just kind of let the doors open. Like, I don't know if I can predict like where it will take me. Um, I feel like with where I'm at, I'm very, like, very happy with where I'm at. So I would hope that, you know, more opportunities will keep opening and whatnot. But man, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure really where I would be. Like, maybe someday I'll, I've thought about teaching courses on social media, just because I do have my bachelor's degree in it. So Mm -hmm. I've thought about, I thought about doing stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure, though. I, I don't know. I really don't know. I just, I kind of put my head down and work and meet those small goals. And I feel like doors have just open for cool opportunities and that's where I know I'm supposed to go so yeah I don't know I'm not sure I've been asked that a lot and I don't know I'm just gonna keep working hard and just see where it takes me but well sometimes achieving those small goals add up to the big goals it's yes a give or take but usually that's once you start achieving your small ones those bigger ones add it may take time and it may not be right then and there but they come so yes, that definitely. that it happens any other way. Yes, definitely. I, I like how you I like ahead. how you're saying with you aren't making crazy expectations because I think sometimes we can get too ahead of ourselves and make these expectations that aren't realistic. And so I like how you say you're just going with the flow and kind of whatever God guides you to do is what you're gonna do. I think that yeah. Like I said, we get caught up with these fake expectations in our own mind. And I think it can often cause us to get discouraged because we didn't get as far as we thought. So I like how you said, I'm just going wherever God leads me and keep my head down and just go in that way. Yeah, I love that. You sum it up way better than I said it. I love that. That's, yeah. And, you know, that's not to say, like, don't be goal oriented. Like, do be goal oriented. Like, those small ones, like you guys have both just totally wrapped it up perfectly. Those, the small goals really do make it. And then, yeah, that really is a big thing. I guess I didn't think too much about that. But yeah, it's easy to get discouraged if you're like, I am going to go for this huge goal. Like sometimes you just have to pick those small ones and like slowly pick at it. I call like mine the goal mine that I have underneath myself. Like I love that. But you guys just said it perfectly. Well, and I think too, like for their age, you know, they're both in high school and stuff. And I I think when it comes to being in high school, you feel like you only have a set amount of time to achieve these goals. You've only got four years to make the high school finals. You've only got three years to make the junior high finals or the IFIR or whatever it is that is high school related. But um, it's, it can be when you don't, when you're still in that moment and you don't know what it's like on the other side of it, it's hard to feel like there's something beyond that goal, but there is, you know, there's, there's going to be so many more opportunities. And I think um, in my experience, at least as I get older, as I've 
experienced more, like I realized more and more that there is time, there will be other goals. The things that you achieve are wonderful. The things that you don't achieve, um, you know, that maybe was something that you wanted to, if you just quit putting so much pressure on it, something else is going to come to fruition in the future, if that makes yes. sense. Yes, absolutely. I love that for sure. Yeah. So don't put too much pressure on yourself in high school. Pretty much. Yes. Amen to that. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I do that quite often. <laughs> There's more to life than high school rodeo. And that's another thing too, like to the parents that listen to this. I feel like sometimes parents can put a lot of pressure on their kids without meaning to, but like, oh, you know, this is your last year to make the high school finals or only got two years left to make it to the short go at state finals. Or, you know, we better get you a horse because the world's going to come to an end once you graduate. The world does not come to the end. Like no. the, the doors will just <laughs> continue not. to open. Life continues to get better, more exciting. Like. Uh, and and it's in every sport we see it in every industry in every sport whether it's rodeo or football or baseball or whatever Uh, but I promise you like parents you're setting your kids up for failure if you're teaching them or if you're pushing them to believe that they're going to fail if they don't achieve this goal Um, so make sure to like sure it's going to be really cool if they do but if they don't the lesson's going to be just as valuable along the way as if they win the title yeah 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 even I mean high school like oh man just enjoy it high school rodeo is so so fun I mean that was one thing I was so grateful that my parents never pushed me hard like if it was like you want to go after this you do it we'll support you in any way possible but we're not gonna like push you to the limit and like you know make you be out there and run laps or no like they never pushed me like that and I honestly think that does the best because you're teaching your kids like hey take the responsibility if you want to do this do it like I will be here to help you And that's how it ends up being in the rest of your life too. Like no one's going to sit there and say, Hey, go do this, go do that. No one's going to do that. You have to take your own accountability. So I love that. I mean, you have to have people support you for sure. And high school rodeo is so fun though. Just enjoy it. I always tell my sister, I'm so jealous that she's still in high school rodeo because it's so fun. Like it's just, just (laughs) have fun. It's way, way fun. It's a fun time. So is college rodeo. So is all of rodeo, but. High school, college, rodeo, it's a good time. I bet. And, like, going back to what you said, Brianna, like, you've got those parents, or Miss Camry said that too, that push you so much when they already know you're going to be down on yourself. Like, my parents, if I have a bad run, they know I'm already beating myself up about it, and they come out and they'll be like, that was a good run, you'll get it next time. It's fine. Yeah. We got plenty of other videos. But now, like, there's a difference between it if you have a bad run, because nine times out of ten, it's going to be your fault. Like, your horse. Ten times out of ten, girl. Ten times out of ten. Ten times out of ten. It's going to be be your fault. It's not going to be your horse's fault. Most of the time, it is going to be your fault. And. If it is your fault and your parents would be like, hey, you checked him up too soon. Hey, you sat down too soon. That's why he turned without you. Hey, he shouldered because you did this and this and this. There's a fine line between them helping you and them just pushing you down. Like, why'd you do that? You just messed up that whole run. Now you ain't going to the finals. Like, and that's why I'm so grateful to have parents that don't do that. Yes, they're going to want me to go to my best, to be my best that I can be, but they're not going to come out and be like, well, you just messed it up for yourself. You're not going to the finals. You yeah. did that. Yeah. That's that's done right there. And I'm so grateful to have parents that support me. However, if I have a bad run or I have a run that makes me make it to the finals. Yeah. Yeah. It's better to have a happier kid. I, I know quite a few people that we've talked on that conversation. And like the people that, I mean, people that like won everything in high school rodeo. Like, I mean, I had a friend that I was talking to her and I was like, oh, like, your parents seem super supportive and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, behind the scenes, I hate it. She's like, I absolutely hate it. They push me all the time. So, I mean, just as a parent, like I think, and I, you know, I really don't have room to talk. I'm not a parent yet, but like, yeah, just keep in mind, your kids are going to already beat themselves up. They already know what happened. Like just be there to support them. You know, you can, if they ask, say, Hey, like, why did this go wrong? Like, heck yeah. Tell them. But I think parents, 
I at least for me and what I have seen, I think the parents that can just support in the ways of I'm here to video, I'm here to help you walk your horse in, I'm here to high five you, like whatever else, pin your back number on, like those are the kids I think that end up falling in love with it more and working hard and accomplishing more. I mean, I think the sad part I've seen sadly a lot of parents get too hard on their kids and the kid doesn't want to do it anymore. So you have to, cut, I'll, you know, keep that in mind again. I don't have room to talk. I'm not a parent yet, but that's just what I have seen as I've dealt with so many parents and so many, you know, kids running and stuff like that. So. No. One thing that we work out, like I've worked with my parents a lot on both sides of it, like helping my mom, being helped by my mom and my dad, same thing. And um, worked with a lot of kids and stuff as well. And I always encourage, like my dad and I literally just had this conversation the other day. Um, about like, can I offer you an observation? You know, like asking the question. I love and, that. You know, when your kids are done making a run, like, hey, how do you think it went? Like, what went right? Like, just questions. Ask questions, and because your child's probably going to answer what you want to, what you want to tell them anyway, because they probably felt it. You know, just like you guys were talking about, they probably know they sat down too soon. They probably know they did this or that. And if you can say, hey, like, yeah, you probably did those things too, but. There's something different that I saw if you're interested, but wait till they're ready for that information, because if you're not open to it, then it just pisses you off. Yes, <laughs> and absolutely. That's what happens. Um, but if you, and even just taking some time to be like, hey, good job. And establishing that you're going to give a grace period when you're done making a run. Like the first thing you're going to do when you come out with your parents is a high five. Good job. You know, you did hey you improved on this today like I saw that today and then give that 10 minute grace period until that horse is cooled out and unsaddled and then say all right let's talk about your run what you think yeah um, I think that can make a huge difference too and it will establish much stronger happier relationships with uh parents and children <laughs> yes I love that I think that's perfect like asking can I give you advice I, I like that I really like that yeah yeah, can I share something with you? Can I offer you an observation? Like it's a putting the ball in their court to take it. I like it. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And vice versa. Kids get to give their parents feedback sometimes too. And they're like, hey, can I offer you some feedback that would help me help help you help me better? Like that's there's yeah. nothing wrong with having those conversations and being transparent. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I had a show Saturday. And I did not do my two geldings justice. We had some some iffy runs. There were some good ones, but there were some iffy runs. And I remember on the ride home, I was in the car with my coach and my mom. And I was like, you know, I would have had some better runs if I wasn't riding like a chicken. And I was just like beating myself up about it. And they were like, kid, you're just beating yourself up about it. Have fun. You're still like young. You're still in high school. You're going to have good runs. You're going to have bad runs. Yeah. And like I said, I'll say it, I'll say it a hundred times. I'm just so thankful to have people like that that don't they're gonna push you to be your best, but they're when you have a bad run, they're not gonna be like, Well, dang, you stink. Like go in there and fix that mm-hmm. and do better and all this. And I'm just glad, grateful to have people in my life that are the opposite of that, but also push me to still be my best. Yes, absolutely. I love that. So what are some of the big, your biggest accomplishments that you've gotten from doing all your clinics and other stuff like this? Hmm. Man, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I've looked at accomplishments a little bit different over the last few years than usual. I think usually if you ask me like, Oh, what, what's your biggest accomplishment? They come out saying, Oh, I won the one D in this race. I won this rodeo. Like, I think for me, um, seeing what I can do to help people has been the coolest and biggest accomplishment that I know I did not do alone. Um, the clinics I feel like are a huge accomplishment. Like I had no idea I was capable of doing that kind of stuff. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm a no name. Like I'm not that cool. I'm not that famous, but so the clinics I think are one of my biggest accomplishments, accomplishments. Um, and then especially like in my business, just with like what I've done so far, I feel like is like my ultimate huge accomplishment that I've seen so far. Um, And then probably just like uh, bettering myself. I feel like as a writer all the time, 
um like you know I've been doing this for a long time but I feel like I've like really done a good job at like taking things into my own hands and really like figuring out how to ride better and how to be like the best rider I can be for every horse I get on or every person I come in contact with that I'm teaching you know how to ride how to run barrels how to do xyz I feel like that's been like the coolest thing that I've got to do and like accomplishment if you know if you call it that but I feel like it is but so we're getting close to six o'clock so hmm. I have a guess okay so... you can answer a couple more you're good as long as you guys are okay with that go for it I'm having fun I'm having fun talking go for it <laughs> so this could be like this is a probably, I don't know, a harder question because there could be so many different answers to it. But what do you think the key to success is? The key question. Man, that's a good question. Um, I would say mindset, having the correct mindset. And I really think the relationships that you have with people are a huge key to success like I have learned that time and time again like the relationships that you have with people really can like help you get places you could have never ever ever dreamed about being so I feel like the most successful people have relationships with people that help them get to where they want to be and they could never do it without those people so, and then, you know, coming back to the mindset thing, like you have to have a really, really good mindset to do this kind of thing. Like horses get hurt, you get hurt, um, you know, things happen, you don't have enough money to do this, or you have so much success, like you don't let it go to your head. Like mindset is such a big, important factor. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are like, oh, work hard and this and this and this. Like, yeah, everything takes hard work for sure. But I think mindset and the relationships that you have with people are a really huge key to success, especially like not just in the horse world, but like with business, like everything that I can do in business, you almost have to like transfer that to the horse world. It's just the relationships that I have in my business have really taken me so many places. And then the relationships that I've had with other people in the horse world have also taken me so many different places. So there's so many things that have happened that like I couldn't have never done on my own. Like I, owe it to other people so I would say relationships and your mindset are like probably the two biggest keys I think for me yeah I would say putting God first that's that's so important yes I think that's like when I think about my business ventures and the places that I've been when I built my relationship and the foundation on the things that I did on letting the Holy Spirit lead that path that has been the game changer for me and um definitely. definitely the people you surround yourself with but he will help you to he'll draw you to the people or the people will be drawn to you if you're putting him in the lead and that's 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 what it is for me what's it for you Allison I like that um what's your key for success what do you think I think definitely putting God first though because I feel like sometimes we get we try and do it so much on our own and lean on people and worldly things and not lean on him first. Yeah. And then preach it, sister. And we put him second when, but it's just sometimes not necessarily how our brains are wired, but it's just sometimes how we think. Like, oh, let yes. me this person first. Let me not sit here and pray about it before I go to this person so they could maybe, God can maybe use them to tell me what to do instead sometimes we just go to them first and they just give us what's off the top of their heads when you could have prayed about it before and who knows he could have spoke to them to tell you to do yeah so I think I, I love that it's putting him first too I love that Isaiah are you still with us yes I'm here all right what's your what what do you think the key to success is I like how she said about relationships she didn't just say having relationships. She said the right relationships as well as the right connections because we can get caught up in having the wrong relationships or having the wrong corrections. And it's like you said, most people have good intentions, but 
sometimes it's not exactly what you need, maybe not what you need at the time, but I just like how she said, and that's what I would agree. I would say having the right relationships and the right connections and even being that connection to other people who might need it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I like that. I love that last part too. That's so important. I agree with that. Does anybody have anything else to add or any questions? I don't. I think that's been awesome. I I love what you're doing on TikTok. Like that's where I see your stuff anyway. And um, we sent at least I think we sent one or two kids to one of your clinics at least. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool that you are incorporating just a, a simple place for people to get started, like basic videos to more advanced stuff. But um, you know, every time I listen to him, like, oh yeah, that's good information. Like, that's really like, if what if it uh, might be something that I'm learning, or I think about these guys, and I'm like, man, yeah, like somebody's gonna learn a lot from this. So I really appreciate it, and I think that the industry really needs people to keep it simple, like what you're doing, and um, even simplifying. You know, it's it's one thing to have a coach. It's one thing to have somebody that you like, you like their style. You know, the people that you surround yourself with, but not everybody really knows how to communicate and coach and there's a lot of people who are very talented um one of my best friends I'll never forget you know she was talking about her husband and he's very a very talented team roper I mean just very natural but the key is that it's natural for him it's easy he doesn't have to think about it and so for the people who don't have to think about it they might be winning the world 10 15 times but it's so easy for them and it's come easy for them and they have so much muscle memory that they don't know how to break it down and keep it yep. simple. And so Absolutely. that's where I love what you're doing because you're breaking it down. You're simplifying things. You're you're coaching, you're teaching, and not everybody has the ability to do that. And that's where, you know, before you're saying, so maybe I haven't won the world. Maybe I don't have this long list of quote unquote accomplishments that you hear them talking about on the Cowboy Channel or whatever, mm-hmm. but yeah. you don't need to because that's not what they're hiring you for. That's not what you're here for. You're here because you can break it down because you can watch and you can see and you can point out things and connect the dots to help people make those runs better. And so I just want to encourage the people who are listening, if you see somebody and they can communicate with you and if they can make your runs better, who cares what their accolades are if they can help you be successful and you trust them and they're honest and yes, you want them to have good horsemanship too. You know, they're, they're terrible horsemanship. Yes. Don't go there. But if they have good horsemanship, um, even if their statistics aren't quite as much, as big as somebody else's or as long as somebody else's don't count them out as somebody who can, can bridge that gap for you because there's a lot of people who can. Absolutely. Thank you, by the way, for the kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're doing great. That's... Keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. I mean, the coach that I have go ride with all the time, he's never ran barrels a day in his life, but he can look at me and be like, you're doing this wrong. I'm like, Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Let me fix that. And then it's just great. Like it's that just, it just goes to show like, yeah, just cause you've won the world or just cause you know, this does not mean that those people can kind of, you know, break things down for you. So yeah, that's important. Find the people who actually can understand it and figure out like how to teach you in a way that, you know, makes sense. Cause yeah, like you said, not everyone can do that. So. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any last words that you would want to share with somebody, um, whether it be parents or kids or spectators or whoever? Like, just what what comes on your heart as something that you need to share? How can Rodeo Kids be a vessel for a message that you have? Man, um, I would say take the best care of your horse that you possibly can, meaning care feeding learning how to ride them the best that you can be and that'll take you places like if you can really figure that out and figure out how to again have the horsemanship and take care of that horse like those horses truly know how much work you're putting into them to feel good to look good you listen when they don't feel good like they know 110 percent. they know that you're trying to help them and like you're understanding them Like they will try so much harder for you and take care of you so much more. Like I would say that's the biggest thing. I would say take care of your horse. Like they're they they will take care of you if you take care of them. I agree. I agree with that one. Great advice. Love that one. Thank you for 
coming on here and talking with us for this past hour. It's very much appreciated. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm glad you had let's, me. This was fun. Yeah, let's wrap it up with a quick prayer. Allison? Yeah, I'll, I'll pray. Okay. Dear God, I pray that you just go with us through the rest of the day and through the rest of this week. And I pray that we just use this podcast today to glorify you and maybe share something and teach something that somebody somewhere needed to hear. And I pray that you just be with us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. This is awesome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. You guys are doing awesome things too. I have to say everything even when you sent me the gal who came to the clinic I like looked into everything I was like this is so cool so you guys you guys are doing awesome things so keep up the good work too thank you have a good night okay you too we'll see ya thanks guys